Chapter Two, Part Two of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Five, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Forty-five. The officers came therefore to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why did ye not bring him? they who had been sent to hunt our lord availing to accomplish naught of what had been commanded them took themselves again to the rulers and they are troubled exceedingly at the arrival of the officers not seeing them bring him who was sought and believing that what they suspected had already happened they are smitten with no small fear for since christ was marvelled at for his signs above nature and his words above measure they were wasted with the envy that was their foster-sister and were again in no slight fear lest the people of the jews deciding that it ought to follow him should get clear out of their hand supposing that this had happened for things suspected are ever more ready to be believed they eagerly inquire saying why did ye not bring him what was it that hindered you say they from bringing to its completion what was pleasing to the rulers we are more ready to press forward to learn all and sometimes not discerning what is sorrowful and our eager desire even sees hold on the perception of things we deprecate forty six the officers answered never man spake thus seasonable in truth is it to say of our saviour christ who taketh the wise in their own craftiness for behold behold as it is written he removed the many tangled counsel and showed the whole nature of affairs turned contrary wise on all sides exposing the pollution of the rulers and their unholiness of life as being feeble and perilous who refused not to fight against god for the chief priests and pharisees fearing lest the people of the jews should be persuaded by the saviour's words send out officers to take him thinking that christ being out of the way would remove their care as to him but what they suspected this they that had been sent by them return actually suffering and what it was like that they should shudder at hearing this they learn even against their will and hear unexpectedly from those who speak contrary to their mind never spake man so but since they say these things in excuse for not having brought the lord come let us expand what they said every way considering the sense of what was spoken for if we delight ourselves say they in the teaching of the holy scriptures if we boast that we have been instructed in the divine laws if we marvel at wisdom as some unearthly good why do we impiously drive away one so wise and wrong in no small measure him whom least we ought seeing that we rather owe him special love yea we subject our own heads to the perils of the law thirsting to slay without cause an innocent and righteous one with such a thought may we suppose that the officers words were with reason replete but i think that looking at never spake man so one may say somewhat keener for they well nigh say thus not reasonably do ye blame us who could not now bring you him that was sought for how could one compel even against his will a man who in regard to his words possesses divine nature for he spake not as man nor were his words those befitting man but they belong unmistakably to him who is god by nature for let any say if any they say of the holy prophets can be found to call himself a brook or who dared say if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink when did the mighty moses himself say to us he that believeth on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of water of life these things we heard him say he therefore is by nature god who without peril exalts himself in words above man 
but to attempt to hunt as though by necessity and compulsion him who is above the creature how will one not say that it is most perilous or how could he be taken by us against his will who is as far above us as god above man the officers put forth therefore as an evident proof of the lord being by nature god the words never spake man so on all sides is the god opposer smitten and through what he thought to attain his desire through the very same he is unwitting slain forty seven there answered them the pharisees have ye too been deceived it seems likely that the officers were more strongly jewish and ever cleaving to the pharisees and sharing their common mind and ever soused with the words of their rulers were persuaded to think the same with them as being ever with them but when they came no ways bringing the lord but astonishment stricken beyond their expectation and late and only now marvelling at him whom they ought not to have hated at the beginning and thinking that all the rest ought to be persuaded by them they say with a kind of deep anguish have ye also been deceived and understand how this saying is replete with a sort of despair of any hope as regards the people for as though the rest of the multitude had already been deceived so many as were not overstable they put forth their fear as to the officers for the remaining multitude says it of the common people who are not versed in the sacred scriptures nor yet fortified by cleaving to us let it be granted if so be to them to be joined to him with inconsiderate impulses and easily caught to agree to what he hath said and done but whence hath this error been admitted by you too how have yourselves also been deceived what was it drew you off from your love to us albeit withered in equal unbelief with us something like this does the pharisee's word seem to tell us forty eight forty nine hath any of the rulers or of the pharisees believed on him but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed they fall away to their wonted boastfulness casting imputation of unlearning on those who marvelled at jesus as a wonder-worker and as bringing in things god-befitting and crown their heads alone with skill in the law and knowledge of the holy scriptures and because themselves consent not to those who rightly marvel at these things they believe that they are full of virtue and as though the law bade them find fault with things worthy of marvel and cast a perverse judgment on things that surpass wonder they plumed themselves not a little demented and of too great lightness easily cast into all uninstructedness and whence they the rather ought to acknowledge jesus now present thence are they taken wronging themselves and waiting their collar as it is written for professing themselves to be wise they became fools albeit it had been far better to confess that they knew not the law than thinking and saying that they knew it well and then dishonouring him that was proclaimed thereby to fall into keener doom and be pierced with woes past escape for he which knew he says his lord's will and did it not shall be beaten with many stripes but he that knew not and did not shall be beaten with few stripes therefore in confessing that they know the law themselves full well accuse their own unbelief and laugh at the multitude as unlearned and therefore caught by our saviour's miracles then unable to dissuade them through the declarations of the law they boastfully insult calling them uninstructed who were ready to understand for this is ever the want of more ignorant teachers who having naught to say of what they are asked repel by anger the minuteness of inquirers and they say that they who believe are cursed while themselves would more rightly be persuaded to say this of their own selves for it better befits the unbeliever to be accursed 
seeing that the law declares clearly of the prophet our saviour christ and it shall be whosoever will not hearken unto the words which that prophet shall speak in my name that soul shall be destroyed from among his people fifty fifty one nicodemus saith unto them he who came to him aforetime being one of them doth our law judge a man before it heareth him and know what he doeth one of the rulers is nicodemus and he is numbered among those who had authority yet not wholly unbelieving nor altogether vying with their folly but already pricked not indeed having his love to christ yet free yet to some degree feeling shame at the convictions of his conscience for that he came to him by night and affirmed that he knew well that he was a teacher come from god and that no one could do such signs except he had god with him i think that all have learned the blessed evangelist having clearly said it at the beginning he therefore marvelling at jesus along with the multitudes is somewhat smitten at being styled along with them cursed for consciousness is quick at persuading not to be quiet in things contrary to one as therefore aggrieved hereat he returns upon them equal insult not yet openly but putting forth against them his indignation in words which have their strength out of the law and not an unveiled openness for whereas the law he says tells judges on each question before them and thou shalt inquire diligently with exactness and clearness whether it be so ye judged recklessly those who had not been yet called to trial and before hearing aught of them ye bring against them so hasty a sentence it is ye therefore he says who are more truly cursed despising the law for it is written cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them for in that he is indignant at the pharisees for condemning the people for only marvelling at jesus it is clear that he agrees with those who do believe for being still sick of an harmful shame and not yet mingling boldness with his zeal he permits the faith that is in him to be not seen uncovered but casting about it dissimulation like a darksome cloak as he yet conceals that he is on christ's side yet is he sick with a grievous sickness for we ought to believe fearlessly glorying rather than ashamed practising a transparent openness and refusing slave-befitting dissimulation. For therefore did the wise Paul declare that he that rightly divided the word of truth ought to be a workman unashamed, and himself too showing the virtue that shone forth in himself somewhere says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. Keen therefore, for i will resume again what i was saying is nicodemus speech for why did himself alone speak and withstand the words of the pharisees albeit their bloody confederacy had many others in it but it is clear to every one that since he was numbered among those who marvelled at christ he is showing that they are accursed in their turn who lay a curse upon those whom they least ought fifty two they answered and said unto him art thou too of galilee search and see that out of galilee hath not arisen a prophet being a jew it says and home-born why dost thou feign to have no knowledge of the galileans and art strangely co-ignorant of our matters with those who are absolutely ignorant and being most conversant with the most sacred scriptures and versed in the appointments of the law whence knowest thou not he says that it is not possible to look for a prophet out of the galileans this then is the aim of the pharisees words but we must notice this again they spurn the multitudes as knowing naught of the things they ought to have had accurate knowledge of 
in finding fault with their extreme want of learning and loathing them and haughtily styling them uninstructed themselves are caught sick of yet worse and no wise differing from their inexperience for those on receiving the miracles done through christ and gathering little by little faith in him at one time said christ when he cometh will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done at another time drawn off from so right an opinion they missed only from nazareth being situate in galilee wherein the divine scripture proclaims that the lord was brought up and they therefore said doth christ come out of galilee said not the scripture that of the seed of david and out of bethlehem the village where david was christ cometh but these loudly laughing at the ill-instructedness of the people in calling them cursed therefore were in no superiority to their ignorance for see they too say search and see that out of galilee hath not arisen a prophet but one may with reason moved against them say o ye who yield to none the palm in ill-instructedness ye who have missed and are hard where is the boast of your pride a footprint of wisdom in you where the understanding that belongs to those learned in the law for we ought not to doubt of our saviour christ but to believe nothing hesitating god the father saying of him to holy moses a prophet will i raise them up from among their brethren like unto thee from among their brethren how must it not surely mean of the jews and of israel verily ye shall not need accusers from without yourselves of yourselves shall be convicted of being without understanding for whereas our saviour christ teacheth and openly saith i have come down from heaven not to do mine own will but the will of him that sent me ye were then thinking bitter things and full besides of no slight wrath ye said again is not this jesus the son of joseph whose father and mother we know how saith he now i have come down from heaven since then thou confessest in plain words that thou knewest exactly his father and mother thou knewest surely that he is of the root of israel how then saidest thou that he was a galilean who was born of jews how an alien who was of israel for not surely the having been brought up in galilee and having spent some time there removes him that is of israel from his race since naught would hinder him that is sprung of galileans from being a jew by race if he should come into the land of the jews vain therefore is it for the pharisees wise in their own conceits to say of christ our saviour that out of galilee hath not arisen a prophet for they should rather have inquired how it was that he who was of jewish parents came to be a galilean and so at length to consider his bringing up at nazareth and not on this account stray away from believing but we must observe again that no wise able to find fault with his miracles albeit wedded to the uttermost hostility they gainsay from merely his country since he was according to their surmise from galilee their suspicion thence being therefore loosed not doubtful at length would have been their faith if they had been wise end of chapter two part two Chapter Two, Part Three of Commentary in the Gospel of John, Book Five, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eight twelve. Again, therefore, spake Jesus unto them, saying, "I am the light of the world." As we said that Jesus had made his discourse in accordance with what was written of the feast when at its last day he was standing crying if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink because the oracle of moses had made mention of the brook so now too does he make his explanation most seasonable and due to the nature of things 
for since he saw that the teachers were partners in folly with the multitudes and that the laughers were sick of the like with them they laughed at drenched so to speak all of them in one night of unlearning and seeking to get hold of his mystery yet finding not at all he brings forward the reason of the want of understanding that is in them crying i am the light of the world ye he says going through the whole holy scripture and thinking to test the things spoken of me through the prophets are far astray of the way of life and no marvel for he is not in you who revealeth mysteries and illumineth the whole world and like a sun shineth into the hearts of them that receive him and needs must he who has not within him the divine and spiritual light surely walk in darkness and stumble on many absurdities therefrom but that the only begotten is by nature light as beaming forth from god the father who is by nature light we have shown at great length in the first book on the words he was the very light but we must note again that he says that he is the light not specially or solely of them of israel but of all the world and herein he tells a thing most true for he says that he it is who infused into all the nature the light of understanding and like some deposit of seed sowed the understanding befitting man in every one who was called into being according to what is said of him he was the very light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world but i think that there is something keen deep buried in the words for if what he had said were not replete with something of this kind he would have merely said i am the light but since he hath added of the world i think that now too he wills something of this sort to be hinted god was known in judea alone in israel alone was his name great and all the rest of the earth a deep darkness filled not one of those that were in the world possessing the divine and heavenly light save only israel but as then while all the nations in this world were together banished from the knowledge of god and lay as it were in some rank of their own the lord's portion was his people israel the court of his inheritance so again when the spiritual son was transferred unto the whole world and the light taken away from them of israel and removed unto the gentiles israel was found to be external to all for while they waited for light darkness came to them as it is written awaiting brightness they walked in gloom not in vain then saith the saviour when communing with the pharisees i am the light of the world for he threatens well that he will remove from israel and will transfer the grace unto the whole world and will spread forth the ray of divine knowledge at last upon others but we must observe that although by his hearers he was seen as man and with flesh he does not say in me is the light but i am the light that none divide christ after the economy of the incarnation into a pair of sons for one lord jesus christ as paul saith both before flesh and with flesh and one and alone in verity son is the word of god the father even when he was made man not counted apart from the temple that was taken of a woman for his own is the body and to wholly sever after the incarnation as regards sonship is not free from blasphemy but we must know that though we say that the word of god was made flesh we do not say that he was clad in flesh alone but in the word flesh we signify the whole man he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life he is again persuading them on all sides to aim at hunting after what is profitable and to desire rather to be led by his appointments than to choose to follow their own unlearning and bereave themselves of everlasting life he shows how great shall be the profit to those who are obedient to him 
seeing he is by nature good and willeth all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth but since he knew as god that they would gainsay he fashions his speech after an elder image of things and from what had befallen their ancestors he declares plainly that the desire to follow him will be to their great profit it was written then of them of israel that in the daytime also he led them with a cloud and all the night with a light of fire for when they were crossing the wide desert hasting unto the land of promise a cloud was suspended over them like a roof in the day driving off the sun's flame by divine counsel that is by night a pillar of fire contending with the darkness and marking out to the travellers their unerring road did lead them for just as they who had at that time followed the guiding and conducting fire escaped straying and were borne straight forward along their right and holy ground recking naught of night or darkness so he that followeth me that is to say who goeth in the track of my teachings shall in no wise be in the dark but shall gain the light of life that is the revelation of my mysteries able to lead him by the hand unto everlasting life the lord being a skilful workman in his speech in no wise provokes the pharisees who rage and rave not a little by telling them more openly that they shall both abide in the dark and shall die in their unbelief but in other guise does he tell them this transferring unto the better the force of his speech for whereby he here promises that he who has chosen to follow him shall have the light of life by the same does he show covertly that by refusing to follow they shall have dearth of that light which availeth to recover them unto life for is it not clear to all and unhesitatingly to be received that to those who flee what cheers the reverse must needs be fall true then was the word of our saviour and undoubted that which was contrived through his skill thirteen the pharisees therefore said thou bearest record of thyself thy record is not true dull and slow is the pharisee and most hardly led unto the power of seeing the godhead of the lord he errs again by reason of the flesh and imagines naught beyond what he sees for while seeing that he uses utterances beyond man and hearing words most god befitting he yet conceives of bare man not looking to the illustriousness of the godhead nor opening the eye of his understanding to look at emmanuel for to whom will it belong to say i am the light of the world save to one and alone god that is by nature who of the holy prophets dared to say such a word what angel ever burst forth such a word let them traverse the whole god-inspired scripture and search into the sacred and divine word and show us this but they making no account of what necessarily follows deem that they ought to contradict and advance hotly to what alone they know accurately accusal out of love of fault-finding for they depreciate him as not being the light of the world accusing the things spoken by him affirming that not true is his record for they are wise to do evil but to do good they have no knowledge and suppose that they can overturn and that by chicanery his record attempting to invalidate it from just merely our own customary ways not by the commands of the law for where does the law let them tell us say that a man's testimony of himself is invalid for wearisome i suppose and unendurable at times is a person's witnessing excellences to himself and verily the most wise compiler of proverbs saith let thy neighbour praise thee and not thine own mouth a stranger and not thine own lips yet not altogether false is that which is said by any of himself for let any of the pharisees come forward and let him tell us what we shall do when the blessed samuel testifies most excellent things to his own self 
for he is somewhere found to be making his defence to those of israel and saying the lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that ye have not found aught in my hands but if the law forbade any one to witness to himself how tell me came samuel to set it at naught albeit the divine scripture saith of him holy was moses and aaron among his priests and samuel among them that call upon his name they called upon the lord and he answered them in the pillar of cloud did he speak unto them they kept his testimonies and the ordinances that he gave them seest thou how he was conjoined with moses as having virtue commensurate with him and is witnessed to by the spirit as an accurate keeper of the law how then did he transgress the law by witnessing to himself will one say but he did not transgress it for he is witnessed to as keeping it and he hath witnessed to himself the law then forbids to none to witness to himself and moreover what shall we say when we see the blessed david saying o lord my god if i did this if i recompensed those that recompensed me evil yea moreover the blessed jeremy saith o lord god of hosts i sat not in the assembly of the mockers but was circumspect because of thy hand and the most wise paul again though taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers as himself to testified openly cries out for i am conscious of naught of myself let the pharisee therefore see again of each of these thou bearest record of thyself thy record is not true even though to those who refuse not to chide the very lord of all the behaving most ill to the rest is a matter of course but this we say resuming again what we were saying that the contradiction of the pharisees is no necessary one taken out of the ordinances of the law but made only out of what prevails in common custom and from the habit not seeming to be one befitting good people and their contradiction out of the law is rather railing to steal away those who are already marvelling at him and are persuaded that they ought to believe for they revile him is not true and damaging the credit of what he just now said the wretched ones draw forth the destruction of blasphemy upon their own heads fourteen jesus answered and said unto them though i bear record of myself my record is true because i know whence i came and whither i go on christ saying that he is what he is by nature and truly for he openly declared i am the light of the world the multitude of the pharisees unrecking of danger deemed that he spake falsely for in their exceeding folly they knew not that when some set forth their own nature and tell what is essentially inherent in them we shall not if we think aright suppose that they do so out of boasting nor shall we say that they are bent on hunting vainglory but rather that they declare what they really are as for example we say that when an angel pointing out his own nature says i am an angel when a man showing what he is says i am a man yea if one should clothe with voice the sun and it teaching the property of its nature should say i hasting around the circuit of the heaven let forth bright light to those on the earth one would not reasonably suppose that it were witnessing to itself things not its but what it really was by nature in the same way i deem as to our saviour christ too even though he says that he is the light he will say the truth and will be found boasting not less than they in things external to him the many therefore living in ill instructedness not understanding emmanuel suppose that he is vainglorious and attack him as though one of us and have not shuddered to say thy record is not true to him who cannot lie for guile was not found in his mouth as it is written 
but it behoved him to lead by the hand them who were astray having fallen away exceedingly from the truth and gone away from right reasoning and in all forbearance to tell them that they had missed of what was becoming unholily ascribing the love of even lying to him who is from above and begotten of god the father for true he says is my record even though i bear record of myself for in men is sometimes seen the desire from self-love of witnessing things most excellent to themselves even though they have them not for prone to ill is their nature but to me he says belongs not the power of being sick of the same ills as those on the earth for i know whence i am light of light and very god of very god the father having the nature that is beyond the reach of infirmity for even though he says i became man because of my love for men yet not on this account shall i be deemed bereft of god befitting dignity but i remain what i am by nature god a clear proof of this is my knowing whither i go for i shall ascend unto the heavens to the father of whom i am this i suppose one would say pertained not to a man as we are but to him who is by nature god even though he became man hence the words i know whence i am indicates that the son is by nature of the father and the whither i go a demonstration of god befitting authority for he will ascend as god above the heavens as paul saith yet hath it some fit threat even if not altogether clear against the impiety of the jews for that he shall full soon depart altogether from their race does he here evidently say and leaving them in dearth of the divine light will prepare them for being in ignorance and deep darkness as he shows them elsewhere more clearly for he says while ye have the light walk in the light lest darkness come upon you fifteen ye judge after the flesh i judge no man we shall again find the lord of all using gentleness most worthy of love for not with equal wrath does he repay those who blaspheme him albeit knowing that they ought to participate in bitter punishment but imitating the more gentle of physicians he will i deem in this too be rightly marvelled at for they often make no account of the slights of the sick but forbearing most patiently make their skill helpful to them curing what gives them pain and railed at at times they explaining what is for the good of health persuade them to be diligent in what is for their good and make known the cause of their sickness and the lord jesus christ both bears with those who blaspheme him and reviled he does them good he binds up the wounds of them who insult him yea and most clearly counts up to them the causes of their unbelief in him whence their sickness befell them for ye he says judge after the flesh that is to say ye err and with great reason since ye look to this flesh alone albeit ye ought far rather to give heed to the magnificence of the deeds believing that i am such an one as you because i am clothed in your flesh ye have been greatly deceived and not contemplating the deep mystery of the economy with flesh ye put forth a most ill-advised judgment against me saying that the truth lies but i shall put off judging you until another time for god sent not his son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved i think then that the question before us has been solved not amiss but one may going through other thoughts also make the sense clear as far as we are able ye he says judge after the flesh i judge no man 
having not at all he says to find fault with and not able to reasonably blame my wonder-workings ye depreciate them only on account of the flesh and because i am seen a man as you ye impiously class me as nothing but i he says do not for this condemn you for not because ye are men by nature shall i therefore esteem you as nothing nor for this shall ye render account to the judge i find not fault with the nature i condemn not mine own creation i say not that there is any transgression in man from his being man yet ye by reason of the flesh esteem me as naught and for this did ye condemn me but i have not so reckoned of you but knowing that a great and honourable thing is man even though he be made of earth albeit very god and in the form of the father who begat me i humbled myself taking servant's form and made man in respect of which alone am i now condemned by you albeit myself condemning no man for this and if i judge my judgment is just and true because i am not alone but i and the father that sent me doth then will haply one say of those who think contrary to the doctrines of the church the son know how to judge aright only for this reason that the father is with him when he does so this being so and that in truth what yet hinders from saying that the son is in a way directed unto uprightness through the will of the father not possessing this in perfectness nor able of himself to act irreproachably what then shall we too respond to their words impious sirs is your idea and most befitting jewish folly alone for not as though not possessing the power of judging rightly of himself does the son so speak for the psalmist will testify to him saying in the spirit god is a righteous judge and that none other save he is judge himself will be our witness saying in the gospels for neither doth the father judge any man but hath given all judgment unto the son hath then god the father given the judgment to one who knoweth not to judge rightly but any one i suppose would attribute to the uttermost folly so to deem of the righteousness of the father that is to say the son for the father knoweth his own offspring and gave him judgment and by giving it clearly testifies his power to judge aright it is therefore most manifest that not as being impotent to judge justly does he say that the father co-judges with him but the words are replete with some thoughts akin to those above and in sequence what then he wishes to make known we will clearly say ye he says o leaders and teachers of the jews made an evil and most unjust judgment against me for by reason of only the flesh ye deem ye ought to esteem me as nothing although i am by nature god but i when i begin to judge of you shall not put forth such a judgment against you for not because ye are men by nature shall i therefore deem it fit to condemn you but having the father in all things co-willer and co-judge i condemn you justly and why ye did not receive him who cometh from heaven ye have not ceased to insult him that was sent to you from the father ye depreciated me who came for the salvation of all for merely the flesh's sake spurning far the law which was ever dear to you for where tell me doth moses bid you condemn any because he was a man by nature ye therefore judge and reckon unjustly for ye have not the law as your co-willer herein but by yourselves are bold to every daring deed not having the inspiration of the divine will but i not so for having in myself the father as my assessor and co-approver in all things that concern you 
i judge most justly in giving up to desolation your whole country and burying it in the misfortunes of war yea in expelling from the very kingdom of heaven those who have so raged against him who willeth to save them and who for this cause came in man's form seventeen eighteen and in your law it is written that the testimony of two men is true i am one that bear witness of myself and the father too that sent me beareth witness of me having said that god the father will co-judge and co-condemn those who blaspheme against him he taketh a pair of persons and do something else that is profitable for i he says will not refuse to tell you what i am by nature for i am the light of the world and i would not seem to any to be fond of boasting for not in external endowments but in those that accrue to me essentially do i glory but if in saying this i seem to you not competent to receive from you approval for truth because i am alone and have witnessed to myself i will take to me god the father co-working and co-witnessing to my endowments for he co-works with me he says as ye see and co-operates for as far as regards human nature i should not do anything at all if i possessed not the being god by nature as far as regards my being of the father and having in myself the father i confess that i can accomplish all things and am witnessed to by the nature of him who begat me for as having him in myself by means of sameness of nature i come to the achieving of all things unhindered for our lord jesus christ hath of the divine nature all creative power as god even though he became man and he is witnessed to by the father having him co-worker in all things according as it is said by him of myself i do nothing but the father that dwelleth in me himself doeth the works but we deem that the father co-works with the son not as introducing some other power of his own for the achievement of the things done to one who was wanting in power for if we thus conceive we shall concede that both the power of the father and that of the son are surely imperfect if aught of miracle be wrought by them both as though one were not sufficient for the need but conceiving of and taking the words in more pious wise we shall say that since there is in father and son one godhead and the undifferring authority and power of the same nature the works of the son will surely be those of god the father those again of god the father the works of the son but he saith i do nothing of myself not as though a servant or underworker or in position of a learner and waiting to be commanded by the father or instructed in order to accomplish wonders but rather signifying with all precision that having sprung of the essence of god the father and like light produced ineffably and without beginning from his innermost bosom and eternally co-with him and conceived of and being the image and impress of his person he hath the same mind so to speak with him and the same energy in everything for that he might clearly teach that he is co-willer in all things with him who begat him he says i do nothing of myself just as though he said i am not turned out to any private will of my own which is not in god the father whatever the nature of the father wills and judges this same is surely in me too since i beamed forth of his bosom and am the very fruit of his essence hard then are these things to explain in that which is unattainable by the very understanding may not without difficulty be unfolded through the tongue nevertheless bringing such things as far as in us lays to a pious view we shall gain to ourselves heavenly reward 
and thus preserve our mind unwounded and unmoved by turnings aside unto aught else but we must note that the saviour adding and crying to the jews and in your law is it written persuades the pharisees as of necessity to admit the pair of persons for i he says bear witness of myself and the father will be with me herein will therefore the pair of witnesses confirmed by the book of the law be accepted by you or will ye again looking only to your envy at me not keep even the law that ye admire nineteen they said therefore unto him where is thy father in this too most especially may one i deem and with good reason cry out against the stolidity of the jews uttering that word of the prophet behold o foolish people and without heart for after much discourse and often with them from our saviour christ who over and over makes mention of god the father in heaven the wretched ones sink down into so great folly as to dare to say where is thy father for they think not at all of him who is his god and father in the heavens but look round at and seek for joseph believing him to be christ's father and no otherwise thou seest then how they have been with reason called a people verily foolish and heartless for able not so much as to raise the eye of their understanding above things of earth they show that true it is which was said of them let their eyes be darkened that they see not and bow thou down their back alway for of irrational creatures is the back bowed for they have this form from nature and there is nothing of uprightness in them and the mind of the jews has become in some way like the beast and has declined ever downwards seeing nothing of heavenly things for shall we not by the very fact itself instructed aright in this matter think and judge truly concerning them for if they had at all thought of god the father in heaven how would they have sought in place the unembodied how tell me would they saying most unadvisedly of god who filleth all things where is he not fight with the whole divine scripture albeit the divine speaking psalmist going through as he was able his words about god and attributing to him the power of filling all things says whither shall i go from thy spirit and from thy presence whither shall i flee if i ascend up into heaven thou art there if i go down to hell behold thou if i take my wings at morning and depart unto the uttermost parts of the sea even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me yea and god himself who is over all showing clearly that he possesses not nature circumscribed by space saith to those so unholy jews do not i fill heaven and earth saith the lord what house will ye build me or what the place of my rest heaven is my throne and earth my footstool one may therefore see the jews in all things without understanding when they say to the saviour christ where is thy father except they say this of his reputed father after the flesh in this too doting but it is likely that the words of the jews had some other deep meaning for since they thought that the holy virgin had committed adultery before marriage therefore they rail most bitterly against christ as not even knowing from whom he is saying where is thy father doting jesus answered neither me do ye know nor my father if ye had known me ye should have known my father also true is the word and in no respect can it be accused of lying for they who indeed suppose christ to be of joseph or of fornication and who know not that the word beamed forth of god the father how will they not with reason hear neither me do ye know nor my father 
for if they had known the word that beamed forth of god the father and was for our sakes made in the flesh according to the divine scripture they would have known him too who begat him for most accurate knowledge of the father is through the son implanted in the understanding of the more zealous after learning as he too affirmed saying unto god the father i manifested thy name to the men and again thy knowledge was made marvellous by me for since we know the son we know by him him who begat him for through both is brought in the perception of the other and when the father is mentioned the memory of his offspring surely comes in with it and again with the signification of the son the name of him who begat him comes in too for therefore is the son a door so to speak and way leading unto the knowledge of the father and so does he say no man cometh unto the father but by me for we must needs first learn as is possible what the son is by nature and so as from image and most accurate impress understand well the archetype for in the son is the father seen and in the nature of his own offspring as in a mirror is he perfectly seen but if this be true as it is true let the god opposing arian blush for needs must the impress of his essence be in every way and manner like to him lest aught else than what the father is be supposed to be perfectly beaming forth in the sun and if he love to be known in the sun and to shine forth in him he knows i suppose of a surety that he is consubstantial too and in nothing whatever inferior to his own inherent glory for he would not have chosen to be believed to be in lesser case than he is by nature and since he loves and has willed this how must we not needs now confess that the son is every way like the father in order that through him we may know him also that begat him as we have already said ascending aright from the image to the archetype and be able to have an unblameable conception of the holy trinity thus then he who knoweth the son knoweth the father too but consider how the lord after having said the truth to the jews interweaves some other device also in his speech for having said clearly neither me do ye know nor my father he draws gently off the mind of the jews that they should not think only humanly of him nor suppose that he is in truth the son of joseph who was taken economically but should rather seek and inquire who is the word in flesh who his father by nature end of chapter two chapter three of commentary on the gospel of john book five by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three that no work of jewish might was the suffering on the cross nor did christ die from the tyranny of any but himself of his own will suffered this for us that he might save all twenty these words spake he in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no man laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come the most wise evangelist profitably makes plea in behalf of the saving passion and shows that the death on the cross was not of human necessity nor did jesus suffer death against his will from the tyranny of another but rather did he offer himself for us a spotless sacrifice to god the father by reason of his inherent love for us for since he must needs suffer since thus would the imported corruption and sin and death be overturned he hath given himself a ransom for the life of all what then will be found in the words before us making for the saving passion 
and what of profit the aim of the thought therein is replete with, do thou again hear. For Christ, he says, was speaking these words not outside of Jerusalem, nor in any city of those round about, nor yet in a more insignificant town or village of Judea. For he was standing by the very treasury, that is to say, in the midst of the very courts in the temple itself was he making his discourse on these matters. But the Pharisees, albeit deeply cut to the heart, and grieved exceedingly at what was said by him, laid not hands upon him, when it was in their power most easily to do this, for he was, as I said, within the meshes. What then was it that persuaded to be quiet even against their will, those who are raging like fierce beasts? What was it that checked their anger? How was the bloodthirsty heart of the Pharisees charmed? Not yet, he says, had his hour come. That is, not yet was the time of his death at hand, by no other hand marked out for the Saviour Christ, nor yet cast upon him by fate, as the lying fables of the Greeks say, or by the hour, after their babbling speech but rather marked out by him according to the good pleasure of God the Father. For being God by nature, and very, and unknowing to miss of what was fit, full well did he know how long time it was right to live in flesh with those on the earth, and when again to depart to heaven, having destroyed death by death of his own flesh, for that not by the tyranny of any was death brought upon him that is by nature life, is, I suppose, clear to all who are wise. For how should the bonds of death prevail over the life by nature? And the Lord himself somewhere testifieth, saying, No man taketh my life from me, I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and again I have power to take it. For if the time in which he must surely suffer death were laid down as of necessity by some other, how should we find it in his own power to lay down that life? For it would have been taken even against his will if his passion were not in his own power. But if he lays it down of himself, we shall see the passion to be not in the power of any other, but in his own will. For then did he permit to Jewish folly to go through to its own end, when he saw that the fit time for his death had now come. Let not then the haughty Pharisee brag of his own daring deeds, nor puffed up with exceeding ill counsel say, If Christ were by nature God, how came he not to be without my meshes? How escaped he not my hands? for he will hear and reply from those who love him. Not thy meshes, O sir, prevailed, for it were not hard for God supreme over all to crush thy snare, and pass forth of the net of thy impiety. But the suffering was the salvation of the world, the passion the undoing of death, the mighty cross the overthrow of sin and corruption. This he, knowing as God, submitted himself to thy unholy daring. For what, tell me, was the hindrance to thy enfolding him then especially, when thou wert gnashing thy teeth at him, as he was teaching by the very treasury? And if it was the work of thy might to overcome Christ, why didst thou not make him a prisoner then? but thou stoodst in anger unmitigated to bloodshed all revealed, yet doing naught of the things thou wouldest. For not yet did he will to suffer, who was persuaded by thy mad folly, as by bits which may not be snapped. These things may one with reason opposing to the vain talk of the Jews shame them even against their will, into not bragging of what they least ought and one may well admire the holy evangelist reasonably showing and clearly saying that the saviour was teaching these things in the temple by the treasury and no man laid hands on him for he was witnessing so to speak to christ's own words which he said to the jews when they were at hand to take him 
as against a robber are ye come out with swords and staves for to take me daily did i sit teaching in the temple and ye laid no hold on me and one would not i suppose say if one thought rationally that he was blaming the jews that they had not brought on his passion untimely nor yet that letting slip the right time they were advancing too slowly to shed blood but rather he is convicting them as unwisely supposing that they should have prevailed even against his will and could have seized by force him who may not suffer except he will for i was sitting teaching in the temple and ye laid no hold on me for then i willed it not nor would ye now avail to do this except i willingly subjected myself to your hands hence one may on all sides see that no working was it of jewish might to put our lord to death but to their unholy daring one may attribute the attempt to our saviour christ the will to suffer for all that he might free all and having bought them with his own blood present them to god the father for god as paul saith was in christ reconciling the world unto himself and in all forgiveness restoring that which had fallen away from friendship with him unto what it was in the beginning twenty one he said therefore unto them again i go my way and ye shall seek me and shall die in your sins that we must needs take hold of the present time for whatever one may receive profit from to oneself does christ herein well declare unto us for to be too late in what is good and to take after counsel for what is profitable clearly brings no gain but ministers wailing befitting the neglect our lord therefore being good and gracious as it is written both bears with those who dishonour him and aids those who insult him and is found as god superior to all the littleness of man yet does he for their good threaten to depart from them and says plainly i go my way that he may implant in them a more resolved mind and that they considering that they ought not to leave their redeemer when present frustrate of his work he may wit them to pass on to the faith and may make them now at length more ready unto obedience and having cried out i go my way and threatened departure from the whole nation he subjoined economically the damage therefrom ensuing unto them for he says ye shall die in your sins and we shall see the nature of the thing bringing in the truth of what is said for they who did not at all receive him who came to us from heaven that he might justify all through faith how shall they not beyond all contradiction die in their sins and not receiving him who can cleanse them how will they not have lasting defilement from their impiety for to die unredeemed yet laden with the weight of sin to whom is it any doubt where this will conduct the soul of man for deep hades will i deem receive such an one and he will continue in great darkness yea he will inhabit fire and flames with reason numbered among those of whom it has been said by the prophet's voice their worm shall not die neither shall their fire be quenched and they shall be for a sight to all flesh whereof that they may escape the trial christ kept manifoldly calling them to a speedy turning away from their wonted unbelief saying not only that he should leave them and go away but also of necessity putting before them how great misfortune they will thence undergo for ye shall die he says in your sins but since he put in between and ye shall seek me and hitherto we do not find the jews seeking him we shall reasonably go to some other meaning for he must needs be true for even though they now in the body and yet in full enjoyment of the pleasures of the flesh for their exceeding senselessness seek not their redeemer 
yet when they wretched fall into hell and have their abode in the place of punishments when they are in the ill itself then then will they seek even against their will for there he says is weeping and gnashing of teeth each it is likely of those there wailing his carelessness in what was good and well-nigh saying what is in the book of proverbs i have not obeyed the voice of him that instructed me and taught me therefore as paul saith let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it for we must run that we may obtain and not by our disbelief insult him who draws us out of bitter bondage but submit ourselves and with upturned hands lay hold on the grace and whither i go ye cannot come not only does he say that they shall die in their sins but declares clearly that ascending not to the mansions above they will remain outside of the good things of the kingdom for they who received not him who came from above how could they also follow him ascending up double therefore is the punishment to them who believe not and not in any single thing their loss for just as they who have fallen into bodily loss of health must needs suffer and endure the trials of the suffering and besides be deprived of the pleasures of health so and not otherwise do they who have departed unto hades and there undergo punishment proportionate to the sins both endure the state of punishment and lose the enjoyment of the hope of the saints most excellently then does our lord jesus christ say not only that they shall die in their sins but also that they shall not mount up to the mansions above for binding them is by a twofold cord does he haste to draw them away from their inherent ill counsel from all sides saving that which was lost and binding up the broken and raising up that which was broken down for these are the ways of a good shepherd and one who readily gives his life for the salvation of the sheep does he tell his own disciples i will go and prepare a place for you and will come again and receive you with myself showing that the very heaven will be accessible to the saints and teaching that the mansions above have been prepared for them that love him but to those who have chosen to disbelieve him rightly and needs does he say whither i go ye cannot come for who would all will follow the all-holy christ if he love not the cleansing that is through faith or how shall he that is yet defiled and that has not cleared off the filth from his passions be with our lord who loves us what communion hath light with darkness as paul saith for i deem that they ought to be holy who would say to the all-pure god my soul cleaveth after thee i think that this meaning is now too not amiss been put on the words before us but if one must go about and view it differently and say yet something else besides we will not shrink from doing this too whither i go ye cannot come being very god i am absent from no one i fill all things and being with all i dwell specially in heaven gladly having abode with holy spirits but since i am the human loving framer of all things i deemed intolerable the loss of my creation i beheld man going away to utter destruction i viewed him falling from sin unto death i must needs reach forth and helping hand to him as he lay i must needs in every way aid him overcoming and falling how then was it meet to save that which was lost it needed that the physician should be with those in peril it needed that life should be there present with the dying it needed that light should have its abode with those in darkness but it were not possible that ye being men by nature should take wing to heaven and have your abode with the saviour 
therefore have i myself come to you i heard the saints oftentimes crying aloud bow thy heavens o lord and come down i bowed the heavens therefore and have come down for in no other way could ye look to come hither yet do i endure to remain with you do ye more resolutely lay hold of life purify yourselves through faith while he is with you who knows to and can compassionate with authority for i shall go yea shall return again whither ye cannot come even though ye should seek the giver of salvation by an untimely after counsel ye shall not find him what follows ye may see for ye shall surely die in your sins and weighed down by your own transgressions shall go mourning to the prison-house of death there to pay the penalty of your lengthened unbelief the saviour then being good and exceeding loving to man compels the jews by fears of future punishment even against their will to be saved twenty three and he said unto them ye are from beneath i am from above some one haply of those who have a more studious mind and are wont to approve the more subtle of the divine thoughts will inquire what it was that induced our lord jesus christ who but now addressed the jews and said i go my way and ye shall seek me to add as something necessary ye are from beneath i am from above for these words seem somehow not to harmonize altogether with those above but they are replete with a hidden economy for since he is god having no need as the divine evangelist john himself somewhere says that any one should testify of man for he knew what was in man for he penetrateth even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and conceptions of the heart he is not ignorant of the unlearned fantasies of the jews who since a gross and feeble mind was their inmate when they heard from the saviour's lips i go my way foolishly thought either that leaving judea he would flee somewhere or that he is saying somewhat of this kind while i live and survive believe lest death should befall me for i go my way taken in its common meaning signifies this too and it is no wonder if the jews have fallen into such uncounsel as even to imagine something of this kind as to christ for they knew not that he is god by nature but looking only to this body which is of the earth they imagined that he was a man as one of us therefore does the saviour blaming them say ye judge after the flesh removing them therefore from so perule and grovelling a notion he again teaches them that not of any one subject to birth and decay are they reasoning such things but of him who is in truth begotten from above and from god the father not to me therefore he says will belong death and flight for i am from above that is to say god from god for god is above all but you will this rather be fit for from beneath are ye that is of nature subject to death and falling under decay and dread of me therefore he says do ye letting go your own weakness imagine not of this sort for not of equal honour with the lord is the bond with him who is from above and begotten of god the father that which is from beneath and of the earth but that from above signifies the eternal generation of the son from god the father wise reasoning will persuade us to hold for from above understood of place signifies the being from heaven but naught would be in the son special above the creature that is below and subject to god if he come only from heaven since the more part of the angels too sent forth to minister walk below ordering some of the affairs on the earth descending from above and from heaven and the saviour is a witness to us saying 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Since then angels too descend from above, from heaven, why vainly does Christ boast as of something great and surpassing the whole creation, and having come, I mean, from above? But one may, without the smallest toil and trouble, see who is by nature the only begotten. What? the angels that are from him. Needs, therefore, does from above signify to us not this from heaven, which is common to him and the angels, but that the sun beamed forth from the nature which is most exalted and above all things. Therefore doth from above, in regard to the only begotten alone, signifying the being from God and not else. For while all things are said to be and to exist from God, the Son has this special above all, namely, to be of the very essence of the Father by generation, and not as creatures by creation. End of chapter 3「Four, Part One of Commentary in the Gospel of John, Book Five, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Rev. Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four: That the Son is by nature God, wholly remote from likeness to the creature, as regards essence. Ye are of this world; I am not of this world. He showed herein and very clearly what is the meaning of above, what of beneath. For since it was like that the Pharisees, able to understand nothing, would consider what had been said in a more corporal manner, and understand the above and beneath of place, and would then stray into many notions, profitably did our Lord Jesus Christ bear his word of the obscurity that seemed to have been cast upon it, and from all want of clearness, putting more clearly in the sequel what he had said darkly. For ye, he says, are of this world, that is, from beneath. I am not of this world. This, then, is from above. For God overpasses all that is created, not having superiority in local exaltation, for it were foolish and utterly uninstructed to conceive of the incorporeal as local. But surpassing things originate by the ineffable excellences of nature. Of this essence does the word say that he is, not the creation, but the fruit and offspring. For observe how he says not, From above have I been created and made, but rather, I am that he may show both whence he is, and that he was ever eternally with his own progenitor. For he is as the Father too is. But he that is, and is eternally with him, that is, how he was not, let the folly of them who think otherwise say. But haply the foe of the truth will withstand us, saying, Not without qualification hath Christ said, I am not of the world, but by adding this, he hath shown accurately that there is another world, the spiritual, whence he might be. Therefore among creatures is the sun, for this is what thy language, O sir, is working out for us. Among those who have originate nature will the creator be surely classed, putting about him some angelic perchance and slave befitting dignity you deem that yourself will escape the charge of blasphemy for do you not know that though you attribute to him that highest position in status which the holy angels will be conceived of as having though you confess that he is above every princedom and authority and throne and yet believe him to be originate you sin against him no whit the less. For there is no worthy place whatever of superiority over the rest to the only begotten, so long as he is at all conceived of as created. For not in having precedence of any hath he glory, 
but in being not originate yea rather god of god by nature but thou again art classing him who beamed forth from god and therefore is god with things originate and thou reckonest him to be part of the world and if not perchance of this one yet of another for imagined distinction of worlds will make no difference at all in respect of having been made and dost thou not blush putting the word who sitteth with him who begat him in the category of his guards and those who stand before him for dost thou not hear gabriel saying to zacharias i am gabriel that stand in the presence of god and i was sent to speak unto thee and isaiah i saw the lord of Sabaoth sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and the seraphim were standing round about him and marvel the prophet was beholding the son and called him lord of Sabaoth, and introduces him as king with the highest powers as bodyguard and that it really was the glory of the only begotten which he was beholding the wise john will testify saying these things said isaias because he saw his glory and of him spake he wherefore the divine paul too both from his co-sitting with god the father and from his being called son by nature coming to most accurate perception of the mystery and gathering the knowledge pertaining to the idea says for unto which of the angels said that is god the father at any time my son art thou this day have i begotten thee for in the word i have begotten he shows that the son is by nature god of god and again but to which of the angels said he at any time sit on my right hand and he does not in saying this accuse god the father of either being wont to do aught unjust or as dishonouring the nature of the angels when he honoured that by a position below the sun for what hinders may one say since god the father is just and good his making the nature too of the angels assessor with himself if the sun be altogether among things originate and connatural with them in respect of having been created even though by some other excellences he surpass the measure belonging to them just as they may surpass us but not unrighteous is god the father who bade the angels to stand in the presence and gave this dignity to their nature having his own son coseted with himself since he knows that he is by nature god in that his own offspring is not alien from his essence how then is he any longer originate how of an originate world and not rather in the same state wherein is very god that is above all things that are conceived of and acknowledged to exist in every world but since ye put out as something great and resistless christ saying with some fair distinction i am not of this world and by the word this ye affirm that the other world is meant saying that he is of it let us see again if ye are not staying yourselves upon rotten arguments prompted to reason and think thus by only your own want of thought for the word this or of this as it may be or whatever we say pronomically is demonstrative and not altogether or necessarily indicative of another and verily the blessed baruch pointing out to us the one and only god says this is our god there shall none other be accounted of in comparison with him but if the word this were altogether significant of another how would not another be accounted of in comparison of him yea and the righteous simeon too prophesying the mystery of christ says 
behold this child is set for the fall and rising again of many dead in israel and for a sign which is spoken against although unto whom is it not most manifest that not as severing us from other persons does the righteous man say this but intimating that he who is now present and has been set for this is by himself therefore when christ says i am not of this world not surely as being of another world does he say it but as defining and laying down in a more corporeal form as if to places the originate nature i mean in that of the man who is ineffable and above every essence he puts the jews in the place of things originate saying ye are of this world himself he altogether severing from things created and connecting with the other place i mean godhead says i am not of this world hence contrasting for our knowledge the godhead with the world he gives of this to the latter himself he apportions to god who hath begotten him and to the essence which is supreme over all but says he god the father will in nothing wrong the nature of the angels if he do not please to honour it in the same degree as the son for variety in the creation or the apportioning glory in befitting degree to each in no wise argues that god is unjust since how then should we be less than the angels albeit we confess that god is righteous what then we are in respect of the angels that are the angels too in respect of the son for they yield as to one better than they the being in greater honour than themselves be but most excellent sir shall we reply shaming the unlearned heretic if even though we be remote from the glory of the angels since we come short of the piety too that is inherent in them and though there be much variety in the creation and diversity and superiority in honour or inferiority according to the will of him who made them yet is the being created common to all and in this there is naught at all that surpasseth or cometh short of other for that an angel should excel a man in honour and glory is not wonderful or an archangel too an angel but the power of mounting up to the glory of him who made all things we shall find to accrue to no one of creatures for not any of the things that have been made will be god nor will the bond be equal in honour with the lord co-sitting with him and co-reigning what measure then of honour will there be to the son being according to you originate and of the spiritual world will he have god befitting dignity how will that which is connatural with the creation mount up to the same glory as he who is by nature god albeit god saith my glory will i not give to another what tell me put the devil forth of the heavenly halls was it the thirsting for honour which beseemed the originate nature yet better and greater than the measure which accrued to him and was it in this that the nature of his crimes lay or was it that he dared to say i will be like the most high for the creature pictured to itself that it could mount up to the nature of its maker and be co-throned with god who has the power over all wherefore he hath also fallen as lightning as it is written from heaven but thou springing heedlessly upon things so insecure accountest it nothing that the sun being according to you of some world and consequently parcel of the creation should be called by way of honour by god the father to sit with him though essence in no wise bestow upon him this nor call him to dignity befitting and due to it for he receives if it be as ye in your babbling say things above the creature in the way of favour 
away with such blasphemy man for we will not be thus minded may god avert it for we believe that angels and archangels in those in yet higher place than they are diversely honoured by the authority and counsel of the all-wise god who allots to each of the things that are a just decree but as to the son by nature we will not imagine that he is so for no glory by way of favour and imported hath he but since he is of the essence of god the father very god of god by nature and very he is co-throned and co-seated with him having all things under his feet as god and of the father with the father in god befitting way aloft above the whole creation wherefore rightly heareth he for all things are thy servants and since from all sides he is found to be very god it is i suppose wholly clear that he is not of this world that is originate for the world here signifies to us the nature of created things carrying the comparison from a part unto the whole that is conceived of as created as then god withdrawing himself from all connaturalness with the creature said in the prophets for i am god and not man and not because he said that he is not man as we shall we surely therefore class him with angels or any other of things originate but from part going unto the whole will confess that god is by nature other than all things originate so i deem that we ought piously to understand the hard things that come in our way for we see in a mirror by a figure as paul saith twenty four i said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins having by few words overturned the most ill-counselled fantasy of those who thus conceived and convicted them again of talking nonsense about himself he returned so to speak to the original aim of his speech and resuming it again he shows them in how great ill they will be and into what they will fall if they most unreasonably repulse any believing on him a thing very befitting a wise and grieved master is this too for i think that a teacher ought not to quarrel with the ignorance of his hearers nor be slack in his care for them even if perchance they do not very readily take in the knowledge of the lessons but anew yea many times to return to the same things and go through the same words since verily the enduring ploughman cleaving the field and having exhausted no slight toil thereon when he has sown the seed in the furrows if he see any spoiled he turns again to the plough and grudges not to sow upon the now ruined parts for having missed his aim the first time he will not altogether do the same the second a like habit the divine paul too practising somewhere says to say the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe seest thou that as the teacher is found superior to sloth then to the hearers often follows the being in safe practice serviceably then does our lord jesus christ repeating his discourse with the jews affirm that the penalty of not believing on him will be in no passing things for he says that they who believe not must surely die in their sins and that death in transgressions is in heavy burden because it will deliver the soul of man unto the all-devouring flame none may doubt for if ye believe not that i am ye shall die in your sins he explains more exactly what will happen and having made the mode of salvation most evident he shows again by what way they going shall mount up to the life of the saints and shall attain to the city that is above the heavenly jerusalem 
and not only does he say that one ought to believe but affirms that it must needs be on him for we are justified by believing on him as on god from god as on the saviour and redeemer and king of all and lord in truth therefore he says ye shall perish if ye believe not that i am but the i he says is he of whom it is written in the prophets shine shine o jerusalem for thy light is come and the glory of the lord is risen upon thee for i saith he am he who of old bade go to the putting off of the diseases of the soul and who promised the healing of love through saying return ye returning children and i will heal your backslidings i am he who declared that the god befitting an olden goodness and incomparable forbearance should be poured on you and therefore cried aloud i i am he that blotteth out thy sins and i will not remember i am he says he who by the prophet isaiah also said wash you make you clean put away your wickednesses from your hearts from before mine eyes cease from your wickednesses and come and let us reason together saith the lord even though your sins be as scarlet i will whiten them as snow even though they be like crimson i will whiten them as wool i says he am he concerning whom again isaiah the prophet himself says o zion that bringest good tidings get thee up into the high mountain o jerusalem that bringest good tidings lift up thy voice with strength lift ye up be not afraid behold your god behold the lord cometh with strength and his arm with rule behold his reward with him and his work before him like a shepherd shall he feed his flock he shall gather the lambs with his arm and shall comfort those that are with young and again then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall hear then shall the lame man leap as an heart and the tongue of the stammerers be clear i am he saith he of whom again it is written that suddenly shall come to his temple the lord whom ye are seeking even the messenger of the covenant whom ye are desiring behold he cometh saith the lord of hosts and who shall abide the day of his coming or who shall stand in his sight for he shall enter in as fire in a smelting house and as the soap of fullers i am he saith he who for the salvation of all men promised to offer myself for a sacrifice to god the father through the voice of the psalmist and cried sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not a body preparedest thou me whole burnt offerings and for sin thou delightest not in then i said lo i come in the chapter of the book it is written of me to do thy will o god i am he saith and the very law through moses did preach me saying thus a prophet of thy brethren like unto me will the lord thy god raise up unto thee unto him shall ye hearken according to all that thou desirest of the lord thy god in horeb in the day of the assembly therefore with reason says he shall ye perish and shall pay to the judge most righteous doom for your much unholiness of manners not giving heed to him who through many saints was foreheralded to you and attested by the things too which i work for verily and in truth no argument will liberate from the obligation of undergoing punishment those who believe not on him seeing that the divinely inspired scripture is filled with testimonies and words regarding him 
and himself affords by his works splendor conformable to what was long ago prophesied of him twenty five they said therefore to him who art thou their word commingled with fiercest anger proceeds from boastfulness for they eagerly ask not to learn and believe but out of much madness they spring so to speak on christ for he says in more simple word i am not adding god of god nor yet aught else to indicate his inherent glory but in lowly wise and apart from all boasting he says only this i am leaving it to the better instructed to add what was wanting and they go on to wildest and unbridled madness and from unmeasured haughtiness they all but cut short the saviour's word not yet advanced to its completion and so to say rebuke and interrupt him in the middle and say who art thou this is the part of one who openly says dost thou dare to think of thyself aught greater than we know we know that thou art son of the carpenter a man low and most poor of no note with us and altogether naught they therefore condemn the lord as being naught looking only to his family after the flesh but the magnificence that pertains to his works and still more his generation from above and from the father whence they might specially recognize that he is by nature god they do not so much as admit into their mind for who will work the things that befit god alone will not he surely who is by nature god but christ wrought them he therefore was and is god even when made flesh for the salvation and life of all but they whose belief is confined to their own miscounsels and take no account at all of our divine and divinely inspired scripture they in regard of the very things for which they ought to give thanks do disparage him knowing neither what they say nor whereof they affirm punctuating therefore with emphasis at the word thou and throwing back what is called the acute accent we take the word as a question with note of admiration for they say thou as though thou who art nothing at all and art known by us to be so thou who art mean and of mean extraction what canst thou say illustrious of thyself what worth speaking of those about thee for naught of such daring is foreign to jewish madness jesus said unto them that i speak to you at the beginning i am dishonoured he says albeit i invite unto everlasting life unto forgiveness of sins unto putting off of death and corruption unto holiness unto righteousness unto glory unto boasting in the sonship with god yea i who would crown you with all these am counted for naught and esteemed by you thus worthless yea verily i am in deserved condition he says because i made a beginning of discourse with you because i have spoken somewhat that could profit you and devised to save those who were on the point of descending to such deep depravity as to aim at repaying bitter requital to him who hath elected to save them something else besides does christ appear to indicate to us hereby it was right he says that i should not converse at all with you at the beginning but on them rather should confer this who shall most gladly rejoice in my words and without delay submit their neck to the gospel ordinances he means by this the multitudes of the gentiles but while we conceive of him as saying thus we will guard against the words of the adversaries for one of those who are wont to fight against christ will haply say if the son ought not to address the jews at the beginning but rather the gentiles he missed of what was fit 
by doing this rather than that. But we will reply, not as repenting of his own, or of the Father's will, does the Son say thus, nor yet as having transgressed what befitted the economy. For God would not have devised aught which did not altogether be seem to be. But by saying that not to you was it right to speak at the beginning, nor among you to lay a foundation of saving teaching, he shows that both the Father and himself are by nature true and loving to man. For lo, he freely gave to the unholy Jews, though not worthy of it, the saving word, having put in the second place the multitude of the Gentiles, albeit more readily making it their aim both to believe and obey him. What was it then which persuaded him to prefer and forehonor before the rest the stiff-necked people of the Jews? To them he made, through the holy prophets, the promise of his coming. To them was the grace due for the Father's sake. Wherefore he also said, I was not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and to the Syrophoenician woman, it is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. Therefore has Israel been honored and ranked before the Gentiles, although he had the crookeder disposition. But since he knew not the Lord of all and the perfecter of the promised good things, the grace of the teaching departed at last to the Gentiles, whom it behoved the Lord at the beginning and first to have addressed not in regard of the promise made to the fathers, but in regard of their innate obedience. End of chapter 4, part 1